Back in 3ds Max once again, we're going to set our units of measurement. Currently, 3ds Max is using so-called generic units. If I create a sphere, for example, you'll see I've got a radius parameter here, but it's in no particular units of measurement. In 3ds Max terminology, this is generic units. Okay, well that's not good enough. We need to actually model this to scale. All of our models should be modeled to scale, and whether we choose centimeters or inches or meters or whatever we choose, uh, we just need to make sure that all of our objects are built to one-to-one -one real world scale. Okay, so I'm going to delete that sphere and I'm going to go to the Customize menu and go to Units Setup. Inside Units Setup, we've got two things to consider here. First of all, the Display Unit Scale. And that's pretty simple and straightforward. This is just choosing which unit of measurement you want in 3ds Max. So in this example, I'm going to model this to a US standard with fractional inches. That means when I type in, for example, an 18 in 3ds Max, it's going to interpret that as 18 inches. OK, so that's the display unit scale, and that's pretty straightforward. I want to also point out the other part of the unit setup dialog is a sub dialog called the system unit setup. And I'm going to open this up just to point it out to you to mention that for most work in 3ds Max, you're going to want to have this set to one inches, and that is the default. The system unit setup actually controls the internal accuracy of 3ds Max. The only time you would ever want to change this to anything would be if you were modeling something the size of an entire city and you would want to change this to uh, meters instead. But you would only do that before creating a scene. Don't go in here and start messing around with this after you've started modeling because you might experience some problems. Okay, um, this again is the accuracy of the program. And it can't have infinite accuracy. You can choose whether you want to model things very, very large or very, very small, but you can't have both. So that's what this setting lets you do, is essentially move the decimal point around to get different accuracy at different scales. All right, now if that's making your head explode at this point, don't worry too much about it. Just remember that it wants to be set to inches in most cases. All right, so I'm going to hit OK there and hit OK once again, and now I've set my system unit setup and my display unit setup. So that now when I create an object like a simple sphere, you'll see it's reading out in inches. So I could type in, I want my sphere to be exactly 12 inches, and hit return, and now it's a one foot radius sphere. Okay, with our system unit setup done, now it's time to set the size and spacing of the grid. And that's a completely different consideration. I'm going to go into any one of these magnet icons. Just right click on any one of the magnet icons on the main toolbar and you'll get the grid and snap settings dialog. Go into the home grid tab and you will see options like grid spacing and major grid lines. Alright, so what are we going to do here? We want to work in imperial units in feet and inches. So I'm going to set my grid spacing to 1. That's going to be interpreted as 1 inch. When I press the tab key on the keyboard, you'll see my grid change. Okay, it's also become a lot smaller. Okay, so I can get in closer on that and take a look. The reason that it's become so small is because the perspective view grid extent is set very low. So I'm going to set that to 24 inches and press the tab key. And now I've got a grid extending 24 units from the center to the edge, or 24 inches from center to edge. Okay, now the last thing I need to do in here is I also need to adjust this setting that says major lines every nth grid line. That's a bit of a mouthful, but what it's saying here is that how many divisions do you want to have before you create a darker line? So as I zoom in and out, you can kind of see I've got some lines that are darker and some that are lighter. Okay, well the light lines or the minor grid lines are spaced apart as far as the grid spacing. In other words, minor grid lines are showing up every one inches here. The major grid lines are showing up every 10 inches currently. So if I want to work in imperial units, I want to set this to 12. And once again, press the tab key. Now I've got my grid set up so that I have minor grid lines every one inch and major grid lines every 12 inches.
All right, excellent. Now there's one other little trick that we can do here because if we reset the program or start a new scene, then the grid settings will revert back to what we had originally, which was not really optimal. So I'm going to do one little trick here, which is I'm going to save as a special file in my current project folder called Max Start. So this is a template scene that gets loaded automatically. So if 3ds Max is set to this project and I just reset the program or relaunch it, then I will get the correct grid settings every time. Cool, now we're ready to actually start modeling. So let's take a look at our reference images. There's actually a file viewer built right into 3ds Max. And in Max 2010, it's in the rendering menu. In earlier versions, it's in the file menu. But what you're looking for is view image file. And you'll notice it takes me directly to my current project's scenes folder. So I can go up one level and I should see my reference folder. There we go, that I created earlier. So I'll open that up and then I can click on an image and load it into a separate window. And this is handy because this is going to stay open in 3ds Max and it'll actually float above the 3ds Max interface. Okay, so as I examine this, I can look at it and determine how should the model be constructed. Your goal here is you're trying to create the illusion of an accurate construction here. So we're not going to actually use the same exact methods that a carpenter would use, but we're going to examine how this is constructed in the real world and use that information to determine how we shall model in 3D. Okay, so basically the center of this whole operation here is the base, the seat base. So that's the most important part of this and everything else is going to be sort of branching off from that. So we'll start by creating a spline curve and extruding it to build this shape here. Good, so I'm going to minimize and I'm going to go to my top view and I can use the Alt W key to switch between the four viewport layout and the single viewport layout and I'll highlight my top view and press Alt W again. Most of the time you're going to want to build everything in the top view because that way the objects will be aligned with the world to begin with and everything will be neat and clean. The other thing you need to know here is that the convention is that the front of your model is going to be facing in the negative y direction. So from the top viewport that means the front of the model is going to be down here and the back of the model will be up here. So it wants to face in the negative y direction and you can see my world axes indicated here. So positive y is this way, and negative y is that way. All right, so we're going to start from a spline curve. So I've got my command panel open, so I can go into the Create panel, and looking for shapes. Now these are 2D primitives, like a rectangle or a circle. So in fact, going back to our reference, that's what we want. We want to have a rectangle here, um, to correspond to the front of the seat and then we want it to have an arc in the back so we can construct this with two different curves and attach them together. Okay, to make it a little bit easier I can also turn on snaps. So the little 3D snaps button, I'll click on that and I might want to actually right click on it just to verify that I'm snapping to grid points. So I don't need to snap to anything right now except for grid points. So I'll turn anything else that might be on, turn that all off. Good. 